This episode is brought to you by The Physique Workshop, the first gym chain in Nepal with branches all over Kathmandu. <laughs> Let's start with the sleep thing. This thing about Tabeko Sanjay ko podcast mein mai le gaye the. You are very huge promoter ke like the sleep is very important and that is rarely that we see in this entrepreneurs ko eda jun um, ecosystem so where this message ke like unse you sleep only when you're dead kind of thing jun eda heroic toxic heroism so ne entrepreneurship mein which is hustle, hustle. yeah which is very <laughs> counterproductive. I mean I understand there are times where you might need to sacrifice sleep tar I mean there are studies that show ki one hour sleep de- deprivation boy when your risk of heart attack goes up by 20 25% which is ridiculous. Let's talk about that. Do you, how seriously do you take your sleep? Do you track everything? Oh yes, firstly, you know the computer ko CPU la pani if you see it and if you mm-hmm. leave it on all throughout the day. Mm-hmm. At some point of the day the CPU is going to get heated off and going to shut off, right? That's right. Uh, that's that's mechanics, that's uh, machines. Mm-hmm. Uh, us humans we are built in a particular way where it is very very important for us to get adequate our body needs adequate rest uh, our adrenaline our our and that has direct correlation with how our mental mood is our spiritual mood is the way we function the way we react everything i think has a strong correlation of how um, quiet and at peace your your body is and that's directly linked to how well rested your mind is right it's your mind which is the engine driving everything um me personally i i learned this very very late um in fact there was this incident again i mean i was in hong kong and um, i had an opportunity of sitting next to this really really well renowned dd her name is ariana huffington you know she founded the huffington post yeah. and i'm talking to ariana and you know i'm you know applauding for the work she's done and she's like ah nirvana you know now my entire focus is on uh, sleep mm. the importance of sleep and the impact it has not only on yourself not only of people around you but an economic impact which can be quantified that can be derived and uh, so i'm like is there any like you know particular time you need to sleep or you know because the older you get the less sleep you get they said well average they say that you should sleep for 7 or 8 hours but more than that what i realized was the quality of sleep within that game and um i started to you know for us uh, who are constantly thinking about 10 different things at any given time your mind's playing tricks on you and you know you're just not able to sleep because one of the biggest problems of not getting quality sleep is overthinking you know um so i i think over a period of time i did three things number one is that I try to compartmentalize my life into that when I'm at work I'm 100% at work when I'm with my family I'm 100% with my family when I'm with myself and it's me time I'm 100% with myself uh and it's it doesn't happen overnight you have to you have to discipline yourself over a period of time and uh, today's day and age you know the kind of technologies that I that are that are in existence which is just free you can even download it for free sleep cycle etc right and um you got also you know apps like headspace calm that's like the prelude to your sleep cycle okay? uh is you know it's like i always give a correlation of our of our entire day being like this muddy glass of water okay? now when you are seeing through a muddy glass of water you can't see anything clearly but if you're keeping the muddy glass still you'll see over a period of time the models is distill and settle down and then the water becomes clear and very very you know proportionately related is our mind it's very important for us our mind to give it complete rest complete clarity you know my guru always says that uh, when the mind is still the universe will surrender once again and i completely agree i didn't agree 12 years ago i mm-hmm. thought that was too you know to metaphoric metaphorically speaking but over a period of time when you get into different techniques of meditation when you get into def- different techniques of yoga i mean these are um, these are practices that's been there for thousands of years we talk about intermittent ones only right oh. 
intermittent now west has popularized it and has come up with intermittent as a term and it's become a rage now right but in our part of the world that's been happening for thousands of years exactly you know and similarly with sleep um i think more than the number of hours you know i think you need to be able to have a very good monitoring of the um quality of sleep within the number of hours okay and today you have uh, technology and apps which you just put aside your bedtime or uh, side of your bed i you know only lene they, they are able to come up with a particular uh, particular uh, i think it's called the repetitive cycle yeah you know which talks about okay this is the time you went into half sleep and this is the time you went to deep sleep and over a period of time because of analytics they're able to analyze why that happened and then you start taking corrective action like i'll just give you a small example i was i, I drink a lot of water before going to sleep so it's always at about 2:30 to 45 that my eyes open up and you know i'm probably in a subconscious mind whether i need to go to the restroom or not so i just reduced my water intake and then my deep sleep went on by another 1 hour 2 hours you know you you get up you get up with um a positive mindset and your entire day becomes positive you get up with a mindset that you know you don't have much sleep and then you become angry right. and, and whole day becomes like that okay? because that energy is continuing with you so sleep is very 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 important and uh, you have again like i said you have your smart watches you have your this is thing called aura ring you can do that or or even if you don't need technology i think uh, there are practices which i do you know there's sudarshan kriya and within sudarshan kriya there's this particular breathing pattern called vastrika okay? mm mm-hmm. you know and it takes a little bit of time so it's like it's like and you go for a couple of cycles with that and you feel your entire body body muscles heart rate everything is coming down over a period of time so these are practices that's available we just got to go and see what works for you i i think like the same goes for me as well there was a time where i was like I wasn't buying into that toxic entrepreneur hustle stuff ke and this was he of course i was busy with my expanding my business as well and the thing is i was sleeping 4 to 5 hours a night you know and this was he after about a month for some reason i went to get my blood pressure checked and it was in the 170s and 130s which is crazy the doctor was surprised on this was he workout got exercise got sa diet healthy sa every aspect of my life sab balanced okay so we couldn't figure it out and this was he i tried to type any do more cardio maybe eat more healthier and drink more water nothing really changed the moment i started sleeping for 7 to 8 hours my blood pressure was back down so tyo bela dekhi what i i have become kind of evda obsessed with sleeping i read this book by um this walker Matthew Walker, why we sleep, Bunny, and this basically there are so many things that happens on a physiological level, psychological level, level, my matter, you know, and this basically uh, that defines how the rest of your days go. I mean, work or the hair, it's not just about the number of hours that you put in your work, the quality of those hours, the clarity of your mind, too much important, son. The third thing, God, I'm a keyboard, a negative board, because I got so obsessed with technology on this basically. watching my sleep every single morning i wake up the first thing is like i my sleep ke bhai raha tha two years of so tesri kare i kind of started feeling ki now i'm getting anxious if my numbers are bugge chaina ke ram sleep are bugge chaina ni right so oily i'm in the same page where once i do my regular practice or schedule of how i sleep but then i try not to track too much just okay and i think like too detailed mo gaucho ni you get just get caught up in another wave just like that it's like uh, you know they say that uh, it takes 23 days for any habit to be formed okay so you use these uh, technologies you use these various um, meditational tools to get you on that path and then you right. start doing this then it becomes a way of life then you don't really need to check it check the stats on your rem or on your sleep app then your biggest check and your biggest benchmark is your state of mind at that time mm-hmm. now touch wood 9 out of 10 times when i'm getting up i'm getting up with a smile i'm getting up with that extra zeal of energy or that thing that wow i'm going to conquer this day today and for that to happen sleep is very very important like like you said you know one one very dear friend of mine in bangalore 
multi billionaire started this phenomenally successful company working out like crazy great food so go out every night you know come back by 1 2 sleep for 4 5 hours again start his day just you know you know back in the days hustling you're hustling and you're like that I'm like bro that's not hustling you know that's you slowly damaging your body a little by little i mean a, a two days of not going to sleep statistically means it's equivalent to getting drunk by i think right yeah by a bottle of uh, whiskey or something like that it's equivalent to that that the impact it has in your mind okay? so before you do anything your your mind needs to be still your mind needs to be clear only then you're able to see things clearly make clear decisions your entire aura and your energy is just subdued okay? you know you're able to be in a happy place now just imagine if i came here i'm like you know i'm just i've just had such a rough night all that frankly speaking i won't do this right. i won't do this interview because i won't be in the right state of mind luckily i had a decent sleep and i'm so happy to be here thank you so much for inviting me Okay, so some the other thing that I want to touch upon is our topic of work schedule customs. I mean, work schedule in a sense that do you have a fixed office time? First thing, or go on about it. So, what do you do in that office time, Abani? Like, is it meetings, meeting meetings, or do you have a set of tasks, or do you use that time to learn new things, learn about current affairs? What is it like from the time you step into the office and the time you leave? Today, uh, the role that I am in is completely different to how my office. Uh, let's say my professional life was structured it was completely different to how it was 5 years ago completely different to how it was 10 years ago you know if 10 15 years ago majority of my time was on the field getting on back tata mobile going to distributor by distributor checking whether products is moving tertiary movement is happening checking the stock level so i was focused on market to market product movement and all of that today the place i am in i am a firm believer that it's it's people who run the organization it's if you are if you have the ability as a as an entrepreneur to put the right person at the right place as well as understand that someone else can do a job better than you can you know if you remove that that ego you'll be in a much much better place i have realized what my strengths are in the company you know um, but the underlying fact is that uh, i spend a lot of my time with my ceos and my hr <clears throat> because down the line also we are once any like kuni company ma if there's any particular issue going at an operating level i could probably step in and do it you know but i i probably engage with my ceo when he stuck and i ask him and we brainstorm and we always have this one particular concept in the office ki if you have a particular view i have a particular view let's go offline let's go for lunch you convince me or i convince you and then then we are on the same page and that's how we tackle the problem so i think now what i am in is in a very funny stage uh firstly for us uh, mentally there's nothing known as office time right sometimes we got to get on calls midnight sometimes you got to go somewhere at 6 o'clock but that's that's part of life that's a that's a particular life that i've chosen um so office time line there's nothing known at that we don't have this mindset of a 9 to 5 for us it's we need to get this work done if it takes us one hour or one month we're going to go at it till the time we get this thing done if we're running a company that has a Thousand rupees turnover or a ten thousand rupees turnover, but if the thousand rupees turnover company is suffering, our ninety percent focus goes in fixing that. You know, so that's the kind of a mindset we guys have have built with. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, a lot of my time goes in meeting with a lot of bureaucrats, common stakeholders, uh, different regulators. Um, it, a lot of my time goes in that, and I guess that's one of the bottlenecks of. you know a part of the world um something that i really really enjoy <clears throat> doing in my group is continuously pushing my team of where we can be so you know just to give you an example if if i spend probably not even 10 to 20% of my time in what we've done probably you got to take an introspection and and understand where the problem is come come we got to identify it but my 80% of my meetings all happen what we're going to do to fix that you know mm. my narrative my goal to my team is very simple that where do you want to see yourself 5 years from now you know let's let's set up this let's set up this goal 5 years from now and sometimes it's a goal which you know people are like can it be done i'm like just let's collectively say that in 5 years time 
I want to be able to get here. I want to be able to create this product. I want to be able to grow through this market. I want this innovation to happen. Then let's work backwards, year-wise, quarter-wise, month-wise, week-wise, to make that happen, how do we do it? Like, you know, today, I mean, a lot of things I'm focusing in my group is bringing in technological intervention. Mm -hmm. So stuff like, uh, I think we're the, probably the only company that completely runs on SAP. What is that? SAP is a enterprise resource planning software. Okay. <clears throat> so all the way from procuring uh, uh, the raw materials to processing it to dispatch to um, sending it to the market to seeing how the movement has happened to planning it out is all done from your computer screen. That movement all happens there. The trends all happen there. The pricing all happens there. The debtors all happen there. Now imagine, I needed to have 20 people. Now I have one guy sitting on the desk and doing this. It's all on real-time basis. You know, similarly, the, the KPI, KRA, mm -hmm. so those kind of, uh, those kind of days are over. Okay? Unless you are able to evolve to a newer technology, newer best practices, you're not going to change the culture of your company. So we use something known as OKR and very similar to what I told you. So if my ISP company says in five years' time we want to be the, we want to have a 35% market share. Okay, as a team, there are various components, finance, sales, technology guys, everyone, we all come to the table. And we guys go off-site probably. I'm like, okay, if for us, it's, a, it's a ambitious, yet we feel it's a possible target, 35% in five years. Now to get there, what all do we need to do? The technology guy comes with this piece. The sales guy comes with this piece. The marketing guy gets, gets, comes with this piece. That our goal is that, you know, but year one, in order to achieve our goal, this is what we want to do. And then we sort of created our own OKR, when it was the objective key result. Okay? It's replacing the entire concept of KRA, KPI. Mm -hmm. So today what's happening is a company are all part of the OKR. So if the CEO has got to do 10 things to achieve that 35%, someone sitting on a field in Biratnagar can open his computer and say, oh, you know, my CEO needs to do this, this, this. My marketing initiatives needs to do this, this, this. So it's it's a phenomenal new concepts that are coming into workplace. Okay? And that is changing the way uh, people's nine to five mentality is changing because now people are more work focused. You know, I'm telling I'm telling my team, guys, you want to, I need my work done. You want to go to Timbuktu or sit in your sofa at home or come to the office, it's your call. So again, this is a transition that's happening in a new cultural shift. You know, one of the biggest challenges any company has is the biggest inflow of workflows that is happening is the Gen Y people. Okay? The Gen Y, our, gen, our generation, Gen X, Gen Y. Millennials are too small, right? Now, if your founders come from the baby boomers, 60s, 70s ko, uh, generation, ma, they, they will never be able to interact and react and communicate with the new generation. Okay? They will be like, we've had a meeting, call everyone for the meeting. Okay, everyone does. One guy presents. Want to hear your views, whatever. This is the minutes of the meeting. Do it. Circulate the memo to everyone. That's not how a Gen Y guy wants. You know, today a Gen Y guy wants, if I'm working with someone in Gen Y, I'll be like just sending him WhatsApp saying, dude, just come to my office. Let's fix this. Talk about it. He's on his iPad or whatever. <laughs> Done. Understood the problem. Problem solved. So, you know, that cultural shift happening uh, and managing that is the key key component of what I'm trying to focus on is I'm focusing a lot on our business growth for the company. I'm focusing a lot on our inorganic growth. I'm focusing a lot on our current businesses growth. And a lot of my time, which I'm very passionate about, is I'm focusing a lot on our foundation. You know, if 2015, we guys always had this ambition that, you know, we have to make Nepal as a true multinational. Our goal is if multinational companies can come to Nepal, why can't a Nepali company go outside? Okay? That was what we were driven by. Our purpose was that. After the 2015 earthquake, our purpose changed. Okay, let that happen. But now, we have to make so much of difference to our country, you know, through our corporate social responsibility, through our foundation, through our various initiatives. But for doing that, we need to accumulate wealth. And the only way to accumulate wealth is by growing our businesses so that we have more wealth to be able to, you know, make a difference in society. So that's what me and my entire family is driven by. And that's why I don't know if you know, but most of our 
communication nowadays is building hospitals, building schools, impact investment projects. Uh, you know, we did this Unnati Women Livelihood Project, rebuilt uh, areas that were affected by you know disasters. You know, my biggest problem as someone who's leading my foundation is we get back to the drawing board and we're like, okay, this year it's going to be five sectors we focus on: nutrition, mm-hmm. women and child, health, schools. But the problem is nine out of ten people who come to us with problems, we're like, hey, we can do that too. So there's no strategy we have in a drawing board. You know, that's something we are really proud of, and that's something I'm spending a lot of my time with: business development, business growth, newer technology, digitization. um working with people managing people developing people uh seeing opportunities within nepal you know of industries i feel will gain momentum and size again something that we were talking very briefly last time was there was a time 10 years ago where i used to run behind every opportunity and i yeah. i don't do that anymore strategically i know the industries i want to grow in the sort of ecosystem i want to create 5 years from now and instead of going for 20 projects i'd probably focus on one or two you know whose size would be bigger than the 10 20 i'm going for so my focus is coming my expertise is coming and i'm having a much better work life balance as well so for me like 7 baje dekh le raha 9:00 baje samo i'm with my kids it's non negotiable you know it's like this this metaphor you have of this marble in a jar right right, right. you got to know what your marbles are and for everyone the marbles are different okay? so mero like say my my marble right at the bottom is my my own health my own peace of mind my second marble would be my 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 family my children spending time with them they're still young my daughter just turned 7 my son is about to turn 4 you know my friends are 10 15 years older than me they're like you know whatever you do bro make sure you spend time with them at this age because mm-hmm. once they become teenagers right. it's going to be very difficult so you know you set these non negotiable marbles and then everything else is i won't say inconsequential but it's pretty much irrelevant okay then you can always prioritize and do you know go out once in a while and you know meet your other friends once in a while but you got to be able to set your priorities right and what i realized is my my marbles in that jar 10 years ago to now is completely different hmm so even like your opportunities or seize garden club and you have to be updated neta kind of kind of information aunu paryo what is going on in the world like can't there opportunities like keep iraq so where do you get that information from like randomly aunu or you deliberately search for it um it's a combination of both plus i think it's a combination of meeting with a lot of people okay you know my father always says uh, your network is your net worth once again and most of the big businesses most of the most of the newer businesses which i haven't i mala the aate aunde no the ki to to us khalko business gan le but when i meet with fellow entrepreneurs and they're telling me about their journey when they're telling me about their story how they how they've done it to be that you get confidence ki it this to bani gano milde resani so i learn a lot from there you know very simple um benchmarking is you know you've you've seen of these successful e-commerce companies for example mm-hmm. hundreds of different sectors you know who've done well the business model has been well in india you know we have very similar demographic in nepal so idea is to wait see what's worked in nepal and just you know when i went to mit for a course the first thing the professor says asked all of us was do you know what the new definition of r and d is people like research and development he's like no it's a rip and duplicate you know why reinvent a wheel of something that's already being done elsewhere just get that implement it localize it to your needs and you're good to go so you see trends obviously you read this today there's there's more and more the amount of information the plethora of information on social media online is so much that there's no end to it but you have to be very disciplined and focused as to which sector you want to be so for example mm-hmm. me you know today our group's core is fmcg hospitality uh conventional financial services but next 5 years from fmcg i want to expand into fmcg get into e-commerce instead of the conventional banking i want to get into i have already got into fintech digital banking psp wallets uh, micro insurance all using technology and third one out of our 15 group verticals i want to make energy as one of our big businesses because that's where i see an opportunity I've, i myself have implemented hydropower projects that it's a herculean task the past was 3 4 5 years of making that plant is it's uh, painful 
uh but once you've got the right person the right team the right technology the right timelines and you're not taking shortcuts on your cash flow there is no business like that that's nepal's global business for for the future so you know i guess it's a combination of all of it you read about certain things as well and you're like wow you know maybe i can do something like this uh but you have to draw a line somewhere saying that does it fit into my ecosystem does it fit into my grander scheme of things i'm planning to grow at you know then otherwise you get distracted okay? hmm so that's where we are that's where i am and that's how i do it so even like my little curiosity i ask people who are into hydro sector matching um do you think there is an end to hamro himalayan water resources when because of climate change and this and that happening not if, not oily right now but maybe for generations two three four generations down the line do you think um, that will be shortage uh climate change is real for sure right. you can already see the glaciers melting uh, all of that but uh, our country's potential hydropower is over 120000 megawatt mm mm-hmm. 120000 megawatt someone close to us or next to us is brazil with about 110000 megawatt and then it's canada and all of that we are just harnessing 2000 megawatt we are saying we're going to be developing another 4 5000 megawatt that's 7000 megawatt the rate at which our country is going to grow in the next 5 years in, in terms of infrastructure development in terms of manufacturing in terms of 100 different things our country's demand itself will be 5000 megawatt nepal india corridor itself requires 30000 megawatt now bangladesh alone today wants to convert its existing gas based power to renewable energy power of 12000 megawatt now the corridors are all being made the transmission lines are all be going to be made so who's going to develop power here you know you've got guys like nhpc and arun 3 and all being developed sure 2000 megawatt 500 megawatt 1000 megawatt but there is still so much room for for potential in this area it's it's phenomenal and and you know nowadays again with the with the changes in technology you don't need to go into projects that has huge uh, rnr issue on sunny you know resettlement and relocation of people in a particular area you've got uh, you've got technologies that are have become so much more advanced that your efficiency of the turbines or your powerhouse and everything will increase your power capacity by 30% your design elements have changed you know and this is the time to do it in in nepal our biggest problem in nepal for doing hydro of bigger scale is that uh, there's there's lack of uh, the debt ki अब तपाईले जति प्रोजेक्ट इफ यु वांट टु डु अ से 100 मेगावाट प्रोजेक्ट व्हिच इज नॉट व्हिच इज नॉट टु बिग बट नॉट टु स्मॉल एज वेल यू नो फॉर अ 100 मेगावाट प्रोजेक्ट यू इजीली रिक्वायर 160 मिलियन डॉलर्स व्हिच इज अबाउट 20 बी सॉल्व हो जाती है नो नाउ इवन इफ यू पुट 10 डिफरेंट बैंकिंग टुगेदर इन अ कंसोर्टियम दे विल ओनली बी एबल टु गिव यू लाइक 1500 सो यू रिक्वायर दैट यू नो 5 और बको इक्विटी बट इफ यू आर लुकिंग एट द सेम component in a different way where there are agencies like the european infrastructure agency ifc you know from india from china from different japan jica who are able to provide you low cost capital debt and you are able to collaborate on the remaining equity with your vendors on a very innovative vendor financing scheme your net equity is not that much but it's you should have that imagination to put all that to structure the deal together okay so i give you the dynamics of why there is still opportunity you know i had a i had a company from north america who came who's doing about 1000 megawatt of cryptocurrency but all you know bio diesel based okay now again because of the world going more conscious to its environment they been asked we are not going to buy crypto if it is mined through uh you know coal fossil based fuel. fossil fuel and all right. so now everyone is coming towards bhutan nepal canada ki because our cost of power is like 2 and a half 3 cents that is phenomenally profitable for people to start mining crypto here why aren't we doing that exactly that's what where i was going so nepal ko context ma why do you think like etro ban gar ra ko ali pani where by the global globally it's moving forward ni ta i mean i understand there is risk associated with it the first mover on my advantage when chanta and plus with all these potentials in unused electricity so jura le supply garna sakirako chaino why not use it in mining crypto what's the bottleneck here 
I think the bottleneck is uh, two things. Number one is fear. Fear, fear of, of what? Fear of making bold decisions. Hmm. Okay, let me give you a simple example. So about uh, six, seven years ago, right? I came in with uh, one of the world's most reputed airport companies. Our airport obviously was nowhere close to where it is today, which again, I it can go to the next level. And I think to to add on a new terminal to to rebuild the tarmac to really bring it to a level which could be world class, but in a smaller airport, world class using a lot of technology, you know, state of the art. You know, we required about. 75 80 million dollars so what we told the government was we'll bring in the 80 million dollars we'll manage the uh, airport we'll make sure not a single person is let go we'll train them and make them to a international caliber workforce we will make sure that we generate x number of tourism's coming in so it'll be our responsibility to bring in the traffic as well whatever you're earning from the airport we'll continue giving it with every year increment now anyone listening to this kind of proposal will throw a red carpet and call you and the people who understood that were like wow this is a phenomenal proposition because government does not need to spend not a single per- person will be uh, removed uh, we'll have a world class service it's a bot model where sooner or later the technology and the people will be transferred back to the government and we are some of the world's largest airport company with credible track records coming in it's a no brainer right but there's a fear of making that decision maile esto ramro decision jati ramro bhay pani etro thulo decision gayo bhani malai media le samatcha mala akhtiya le samatcha mala aru politicians le bhanchu ke ele ta paisa khaya bhanera so this is what we've been dealing with for the last 15 20 years why because in the last 28 years we've had 26 governments right and every time someone comes into power mentally they know that they're going to be in the power for not more than a year So it's more than के गरु बंदा बनी के लियूं के बनाऊं short time में कसरी extract करनी because and I don't blame them के the scenario right. has been like that so that's why the number one thing what our biggest bottleneck is our own fear of making that decision or the con- lack of confidence of making that decision the second thing is you know when India was going through a, a almost an economic brinks of collapse in 1993 तो बोला थे अटल बिहारी वाजपेयी was the president prime minister की So what he did was that he called Manmohan Singh, mm-hmm. who was with IMF at that time. He called Chidambaram. He called Montek Singh Alwal. Some of the most respected professionals who understood economy, who were living outside of India, and Manmohan Singh came back and he had a chat with uh, Atal Bihari Vajpayee. He said, "Mr. Prime Minister, I'm not a politician. I know how economy functions. I know how finance works." And Atal Bihari Vajpayee told him, "Mr. Manmohan Singh, you focus on the finance and the economy. Politics, let us handle. We are political activists. You don't need to worry about that." And that's the time the currency got deregulated. Deregulated. That's the time private sector licenses were opened up. That's the time, because of that decision at that time by bringing in the right experts into uh, the particular ministries, we see where India is today. Hmm. that's the second reason why things are not happening third reason why is not happening is i think even now there is this mentality that a khali tyo company ne matra kina garni hamle ke pai rajo tyati ka e tyo company le matra grow only that company can grow na eru ka sari garcha tele so there is lot of artificial bottlenecks created ke not forgetting that by the fact that i'll give you a simple example you know who are the largest tax payer of the country business houses who is you guys i know how much do you think we contribute to the overall tax of the country percentage any something 2% of the total tax is contributed by one company it's nowhere heard of in the world okay, okay. right now people are not realizing the as a company the economic impact the economic contribution a company makes you know zaile pani that mindset mm. is changing but the the people are still if you're going to a government function you know 
बिजनेस पीपल बिजनेस हाउस बने कि चोर है वो क्रिमिनल है वो दस तक का ही ना माइंड से देने टू चेंज फ्रॉम कि वे डू यू थिंक दिस इस कमिंग फ्रॉम इस इस लाइक इन्फ्लुएंस ऑफ बॉलीवुड मूवीज़ और दांसा द रिच गाइस ऑल इस पोर्ट्रेट बैड कि नो इफ यू लुक एट द वेस्ट मैं ना रिच एंड सक्सेसफुल पीपल आर अप्रिशिएटेड � so why do you think you have a narrative hockey like if somebody is owning a business forget about being rich at your scale if somebody was, owns a business kin ke gadbad gare aunu parcha hai kind of narrative kaam ra hocha oh so they are i'm not going to say uh, entire business community everyone is the dood ka dula ata chai nai i would say they are a small percentage who are sort of try to take um, advantage of certain things and get into wrong way but because of the certain handful of people एट जेनरलाइज कर बिजनेस कम्युनिटी इज टानिस्ट के यू नो लाइक देर इज एन एक्जापल ड्यूरिंग कोविड टाइम ऑफ सम वन सेलिंग दीज मेडिकल कार्ड्स गोइंग एंड फाइन इन इज ओन कैपेसिटी मस्ट हेव डन समथिंग रॉन्ग राइट बट द इंटायर बिजनेस कम्युनिटी ओर सेंग ए सब जाना चोर हो टाइप के सो आई थिंक वी नीड टू गेट अवे फ्रॉम दैट दैट के यूजिंग दीज वन और टू एक्जाम जेनरलाइजिंग थिंग्स के You cannot generalize such such things. Uh, India, ma pani. To give an example, you have you have the Tatas, you have the Ambani's, you have the Adani's, all of that. But you also have now what people say: you have people like Nira Modi, Malia, this and that. Who, you know, but you can't because yeah. give that example and put a tarnish the image of the ninety nine percent of the people. Ni, you know, because at the end of the day, is the economy that makes a country work, yeah, and that's what was Obama's campaign as well. So, um, I guess that's that's one of the reasons. Second thing, like I mentioned to you, you know, it's you need to have the right person in the right place, even at the government level. You know, uh, you need, and there are there are there are few. You know, today whenever I'm going to various ministries or meeting various government stakeholders, just off late last six months to one year. I'm meeting with a lot of people who are in the forties, okay, and who are already in the sachi level. This that, that makes me so goddamn happy. I'm like, wow, these are people who've who understand, who've got the who've got the narrative of the world, who've got the good exposure, who are genuinely wanting to make a difference. So I guess it's a process where sooner or later that will happen. It's a process where sooner or later there will be stability in the government, and the right people will come in to lead the uh, government. And the different ministries and the different because it's it it all starts off from the leadership game and I'm pretty confident it'll happen. Man, it's a sad thing. I think a Bollywood movie like that is just a lack of you. This thing over generalizing. Look at Bangladesh. <laughs> Bangladesh, one of the world's fastest growing economies, correct? Mm-hmm. One third of the entire parliament is people from business. That's one how it really should. That's how it should be, actually. So, they, but they're also watching. They're also watching Bollywood movies, right? But there's a narrative of the leadership saying, "If we have to fix the economy, we need the economic stakeholders to be part of the decision." Yeah, exactly. Right. So the narrative and the and the mindset needs to change. I'm not saying it's not happening. It's happening. It's happening slowly, but we cannot afford to go two steps forward and three steps back. You know, we need to gradually move forward, step mm. by step. अलग तो मैं साइड में भेन्चर कर हिसाब से एयरपोर्ट को कुछ आए थे है आई डोट नो इफ इट्स कंट्रोवर्सियल और नट डू यू थिंक लाइक हम जो एक्जिस्टिंग एयरपोर्ट है तेल रिमोडल कर सकता के सकता और टू मेक इट बेटर इन द सेंस दट एवं रन वे है आई डोट नो इफ आई माइट बी मिस्टेक जो अस्त एयर दुबई को केस भो एयर दुबई और फ्लाई दुबई फ्लाई दुबई को केस भो मैं सुने अनुसार बुझे अनुसार इट्स अलरेडी एट कम्प्लिकेटेड Uh, airport or to land in, especially something wrong. Boy, Raghav, that's why they had to fly it away. And you're a matter of runway, Bokale. Uh, no, no. Traffic I, I, congestion I, I, is not an issue. This to keep emergency. Traffic congestion one. is an issue because of the traffic management. Again, let me give an example. The current Delhi Amritsar International Airport, Sunny. Mm-hmm. If you look at the master plan of the airport, that's actually planned for domestic airport. What are going on with Delhi? is actually a it's master plan ma it's actually supposed to be a domestic, domestic airport, airport. Yeah. okay our international airport is supposed to be built where the like the golf course is banai rasa ni eh okay okay that's supposed to be the international airport okay. right mm. now when we were when we were discussing and putting a proposal mm-hmm. i think tubel if i'm not mistaken there was a narrative that e eh, hamro airport ma to we can only bring in 1.5 or 2 million passengers go capacity sir when we made just 
certain tweaks and processes and halka infrastructure we said that we can easily bring that number up to 5 6 million passengers current infrastructure ma alikata tweak garera naya terminal banayera i know we can bring that up so do you need another nijgarh not today let's save that resources of the state and use it in other work on building education health systems and all of that you know so again these are things that we've mm. said in black and white mm. so i think more than the uh, restriction of the traffic congestion it's got to do with traffic management it's got to do with you know executing a master plan that has already been made money financing is the least of the issue okay? you have to be able to structure deals accordingly properly mm. and it's possible why is nijgar been made because bigger airlines need tara come on we've had a double decker aircraft land in kathmandu yes it's a little bit of a little bit of a challenging um you know the route right but if you it go can to, be done yeah if but if you look at managed. bhutan it's right. it's at a different level so you jun decision making bottle ne kaam ne kura gareyo i know you you kura do you think the same applies in the marijuana industry as well like how what's your stance on marijuana ko whole thing like do you think economically perspective what are there strictly do you think it's a viable industry to get our hands in ki yo sab bhai etike nationalism gof ho ki nationalist gof ho ki unse nepal ko marijuana ma yahan open boy bani esto unse economic better unse and all that thing how do you see that see jumla ma sa ni aha jumla ma you get this black rice ke okay right to pehla hamro bhanu na 50 100 years ago when our royal family was there their only rice used was the jumla rice which was hand carried by that time ke. because it had anti diabetic properties you know it had such uh, properties in it it was like it was a delicacy where is that where is that today no way mm-hmm. today if you take the same rice and market it in america europe you'll be getting three times the value of your normal rice now if we are happy with our normal rice but we've got jumla rice we can exchange 1 kg of rice to 3 kgs of normal rice for our country ni i'm just giving you a very small example okay? similarly you talk about the cannabis industry you know some of the most developed market like even america most of the states have legalized it right mm-hmm. but in nepal's context there is uh, definitely terrain le garda humidity weather le garda there is there could be a huge prospect for uh, cannabis cultivation um it could be an industry but again the the biggest industries is in the forward integration okay? people are using cannabis for medicinal purposes for different more than recreational purposes for many different for clothing industry you know uh, for things like even gummy bear cbd mm-hmm. all of that yeah. that's where the economic value is okay? it's a very simple example today nike gets its clothes made from bangladesh and sri lanka and vietnam is the nike clothing market in vietnam sri lanka bangladesh big no but nike is using that and has created such a value and is a company 100 times the size of that business so how we play that narrative of creating strong innovation strong r&d which requires billions of dollars within nepal to create the right product and we are blessed with the tagline of you know we are a country in the himalayas in himal ko himal bada aako saman ko value is carries that premium key carries that ex- yeah right. but we've not been able to capitalize on that so i think as and when if it happens at all uh, a global market is waiting but whoever does it needs to package it and position it properly and then you'll get the right value of the product is it something you are interested in the uh, industry as a whole you, you know i i've always been debating on this because i i've I think the cannabis on medicinal terms could be a yeah. a good um, product but me personally I you know we were in the tobacco industry now I turned it around 10 years ago and I took a conscious call I don't want to be in the tobacco industry I've got hundreds of opportunities for getting into the lick industry I don't want to be in it I don't want to be in industries or sectors that 
short term long term harm people harm families harm livelihoods i don't want to be that that's a decision that i've made you know i'm a firm believer of karma okay ki what goes around comes around so i've got 10 other things i can focus on so i i i sort of i'm restricting myself from being in these industries including cannabis but if there is ever a potential to develop cannabis for medicinal purposes i would love to explore that bit I think legalize boy when even shuru ma cha it will be kind of like medicinal purpose ko lai nai huncha wala jasto lagcha just to dabble into the industry i don't know that's the talks that i'm hearing but other than that like how do you get on to an industry is there a certain criteria characteristics that you look out for ki like then tumai ko set huncha already narrative like these are the industries i'll go into so uh you know as i have a board i have my shareholders i've been given assignment of particular verticals within my group so we have a pretty free hand in terms of okay let's come up with a five year road map okay and that can tweak so what we do is that we bring in one of uh, one of the big fives ones any mm-hmm. you know like ernst and young mckenzie all these guys to do a, a sector wise and a geography study okay? so for example if i am on if i'm an fmcg if i'm in financial services i'm real estate this that what are the opportunities of things i need to do now that will be relevant 5 years from now which are the other sectors that are untapped into which has a linkage in my existing businesses or other sectors which has no linkage but is a great opportunity so we spend a lot of time doing this macro level hmm. economic analysis and but at the end it all boils down to my my particular vision of where i want to take it again just to give you an example financial services we are doing organically growing making acquisitions growing across countries coming up with new products and services great that's something which i can you know discuss with my operating team and we can get that thing done but then coming up looking at the trend of where new banking digital banking is now coming up and getting on that train at the right time that's a strategic play game and that happens with a lot of uh, it requires a lot of research it requires a lot of meeting with people talking to people understanding the the various governance policies in different countries understanding the consumer perspective from it and that's how i launched end bank and end bank today you know is doing phenomenally well n bank tomorrow is the future of banking is it today no 5 years it will be similarly every sector you go that way now one of the sectors we were not was mobility mm-hmm. electric vehicles you know mm-hmm. we saw that the whole world was shifting towards a uh, uh, energy play you know where more and more prices of oil and gas was going up electricity our own co- countries electricity production was going up uh, the duty tariff structures were more favorable and for us it was a no brainer because there was no one who was bringing in pure ev vehicles we saw an opportunity and we saw that in future it could be huge it connects directly with our aspirations of becoming getting into telecom and then you have the entire iot internet of things we are already into real estate we are already into uh, consumer durables we are already into fintech uh, we are in telecom as a backbone mobility soon or later will start having driverless cars will it will be run on data of ours mm. so unless you understand the larger narrative and that's where the plug and play happens you know that's how i decide what i want to do now internet ko kura garda hai with the telecom thing i, mm. I where is ki bhai raha tha progress hai jesus that this will require <laughs> this will require amra aaj ek din ghanta lagta so in short in short in short in short um, we got our we got our approvals long time ago we acquired mm-hmm. a company 10 years ago to get into telecom um that time encel vanda pehla encel was there it was owned by a swedish company scandinavian company uh, there were four more licenses given one to a company that was doing cdma um, that i don't think ever wanted to uh, sort of mm-hmm. operate the company the second license was given to a company called smart which they've had 7 8 years they owe the government Um, almost this all was at the I think they're short I know recently yeah, they're not short they owe the money they owe the government 30 car- 30 arba okay how is the government going to get this 30 arba you know uh, why did they do that purely because they wanted to block cg from coming in hmm. they're not going to do it they're going to block the spectrum 
CG is not going to come in. Sooner or later, they will merge with one of the big guys. Similar strategy was with Hello Nepal. They got kicked out of the club. License cancelled. Spectrum gone. But what those guys don't understand that I don't need those Spectrums anywhere anymore. If five years from the from ago I wanted to launch a four G ready network, I needed those Spectrums, and I, there wasn't any. Today, if I want to launch a five G ready network, I'm looking at a different bandwidth altogether where no one is. So my Spectrum is not a problem. While I was stopped from various parties on policy level, approval level, regulatory level, different ministers coming in, you know, we had that spat with <laughs> Gokul Baskota as well. I mean, I did a press conference. He was going on taking other companies' name and trying to mislead the public. So that's when I, Tuvela, my our group chairman also said, if we are launching, we're going to be launching free voice, free SMS, only data. You know, we'll be doing it at fifty percent of the price what you are paying today. Communication is no longer luxury; it's it's a necessity. We were not even allowed to do that, but what we could do and we did was FTTH, ISP. You remember a year and a half ago when we launched CG Net? Yeah. I mean, one Facebook post disrupted the market. Our penetration rate of ISP was eighteen percent. It's thirty-two percent today. If someone was paying two thousand bucks for a fifty fifty yeah. Mbps, yeah. today people are paying probably five hundred bucks for a three hundred Mbps across all internet providers. How did that happen? Yeah. Because a disruptor came in. Hmm. But is that my business? not really i'm building a backbone for my telecom as and when it comes you know i'm still waiting it's been 11 years i'm still waiting for a few approvals to come the day that comes there's no stopping i am going to be the third player i am going to be the number one player and i'm going to bring in data access to data affordable data which is going to transform another set of economy e-commerce e-health e-education e-agriculture what jio did in india yeah you know today i mean a to cha wala dekh le ra pasal wala everyone does his business using data because data is affordable does the same thing happen in nepal no because it's the most expensive data and average revenue per user in south asia companies are working on a 70% 60% gross margin we are still paying for our voice calls we are still paying for sms who does that So now my frustration level is not about not letting me come in but the frustration level is that the consumers are getting fooled the consumers are paying these ridiculous prices it's 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 so unfair i've gone to the extent of telling regulators give me a year let me run it if i don't take my license back other people are running for 7 8 years have you taken their license back no have you taken the spectrum back no they owe the government they owe our government Spectrum is a national resource. They owe our government these these arba. Who's going to recover that money? Let me see. So you have these intricacies and challenges, but at the same time, there's opportunity. And you know the first question: How your day goes? My day goes in managing stuff like this. Do you think there will be a day when, because an internet company signs in and we can solely rely on? sim card with 4g 5g of data of course of course that's and and it is not the the price is not based on the data used but then like internet zone hamle use got so like of course that's monthly what monthly at the that's what quadruple yeah. plays pehla dual play on the triple play on the now we are getting into the age of quadruple play what is that that means if i'm giving you your phone okay no charge on unlimited voice free mm-hmm. sms free data at a very very low price the same data is converges to your you don't need a router anymore okay exactly. because if i'm running exactly. a 5g ready network i don't need a router anymore then my entire home everywhere there's 5g co nodes where you are seamlessly connected to your internet the same package you are able to watch uh, ott not iptv not your conventional iptv box but you are able to watch worldwide information channels using ott platform like netflix is one of them amazon is one of them but imagine aggregating all of that and you having hundreds of channels and ott platforms to work with through one system okay number 4 is you have your ott platforms for entertainment you have your in house broadband internet you have your broadband data on your phone but now we are going the other way forward where your entire home is run on uh 
data and the technology today i'm able to calculate my energy conservation on my ac to when my refrigerator runs to how my tv runs to my blinds in my home you know all that is run through the internet of iot once again yeah. so that's quadruple play but will it happen soon mm, it's already happening in most of the world will it happen soon in nepal i don't think so why not because the technology doesn't exist because of two reasons number one there is no company providing that 5g ready network number two is if i buy a 5g ready phone costs are too expensive but in two years time that same cost of the phone will become one fourth so then affordability also people will have access to afford to buy a 5g phone and once that happens dynamics of the industry and the economy will change industrial automation will start happening and we don't have to wait another 20 years i'm talking about in the next 10 years all this is going to happen so i'm 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 you know in my company i'm known as the eternal optimist <laughs> you know everyone's looking at the worst case scenarios i'm like no i'm always looking at the best case scenarios and that's why i have I have a great team you know who's always sort of holding me down hey let's not get too excited right? you know <laughs> counterbalance kind of yeah, like yeah and that's needed as well that's needed as well yeah so how do you look at uh, you couldn't any project mein jump kar that do you think there is a right time for things ki you just jump in and then make things right there is never a right time for doing uh, there's never a wrong time for doing a right thing i i am personally a firm believer who works in gut i work a lot on gut feel i work a lot on what i see i i work a lot on who i meet there are a lot of times i haven't started project because i haven't got the right people with me hmm. right um the key thing in an organization is having the right person at the right place How collaborating is that you know i thought it was very challenging a couple of years ago but not anymore hmm. uh because what i've also realized is that if you are giving peanuts you're only going to get monkeys so if you are able to have a good compensation for uh people you'll have some of the most talented nepalese you know we have some nepali who could can a part of the team you know i'll just give you an example our attrition rate within our group used to be like 17 18% 78 years ago 10 years ago our attrition rate is about 2% which is pretty healthy our expats in our company used to be about 110 today zero today most of our companies outside most of our factories outside are led by nepali hmm. so times are changing ki I have so much of faith and confidence in my country and our people. It's amazing. Slowly, our command has shifted. Got it. Now, one of the like I used to be a avid reader, wild book part. Like my like one of the books that I've read, the only book I've read and finished in a day is like your father's biography. Right? It was so interesting to me. The book I think it was back in two thousand sixteen, seventeen, thirty when I was just starting my business. अभी मैं आई रिमेम्बर बिहान आठ बजे बस मैं बेलका को आठ नौ बजे मैं तो बुक्न सकें क्या सो यू बिंग ए सन लाइक व्हाट आर हिज कोर फिलोसफी दैट ड्राइव यू अफ कोर्स ही हेज हैड मैसिव इंपैक्ट अन योर लाइफ एंड योर लाइफ फिलोसफी व्हाट आर द मेन थिंग्स जल्द तब ड्राइव कर सो दे इज अ क्लियर डिस्टिंगशन अफ मी बिंग ए सन एज अ फादर राइट वॉट आई हेव लर्न फ्रम हिम एज अ सन इज ह्यूमिलिटी no matter how you big you become as an individual you got to stay more grounded you got to respect people right you cannot uh, you've always got to whatever you do you got to make a difference in people's lives through the society etc uh family value first these as a son these are the values i've learned as a as someone who's working with him in the business there are different sets of things i've learned from him if you put your heart into something mind to something achieving no matter what we have to achieve it you have to have that fire in the belly and till that work is done you have to go at it i won't call it aggression ki is that commitment and resilience and determination to making sure that you are achieving that goal of yours sensing the nerve of exactly what are the problems are preempting it and then creating a scenario where you've already created a ring fence for any problem that could arise being a visionary leader doing things differently always putting people first always knowing where to put the right person at the right place and uh, you know with something that he says is about uh, 
you know, being being someone who has a good knack and caliber for networking. But that's how you're going to grow. That's how you're going to learn. Knowing what your strengths are, knowing what your weaknesses are. So the two from the book, the two aspects I learned as a son and as someone working with him, you know. How professional is he with you, oh especially God. beginning days, man? Is it hard working with your dad? So <laughs> <laughs> he's a hard taskmaster. You know, we call it uh, we call it uh, University of Hard Knocks. Man, right? <laughs> there is no shortcut. It's not only for me. I mean, there's a time when I'm sitting with twenty of my people in the room, and if I've done if I've done something wrong, if I've not done, he calls you out. Calls you out is a very understatement. <laughs> okay. okay, there has to be a professional way of doing it. So we are continuously challenged. So I would have done nine out of hundred things. I would have done ninety good. Ninety good can stay at is the ten that you haven't. Let's focus on that. So there is that continuous pursuit of excellence that is happening because he's he's not only me because I'm his son, but everyone in the organization is pushing our boundary. Okay? Our boundary for a person. So, if you met anyone from CG, if they even even they had whatever experience, they'll always walk out saying, "I've become a better professional. I've become more. I've I've gained more knowledge. I've become. I worked in an environment that is so so um, aggressive. So uh, they don't stop. You know, my father has told all of us that I know the real co pottery is already started, and we all are like nuts and bolts. Either we have that speed won't change." Speed won't slow down, but if you want, you tighten yourself and re- match up with the thing. Otherwise, the speed will get there. You will go flying out. Mm. So you know, I, I was, I was never built to be a businessman. Frankly, I don't even consider myself a businessman. You know, like more like an entrepreneur. But uh, the, the the difference between that is is, is something which I can talk to you uh, later on. But even at the age of twelve, I knew I had to get into the corporate world. But I was not fit to be. So I I used to during holidays, you know, just come and sit in my father's room and just observe, observe, observe. When I was twelve, right, and there were times when I came to the office and you know sometimes as a twelve year old guy, always not suited, booted, right. They will only allow I hadn't worn a tie, and I was given hell for not mm. doing that because if you want to come into a particular environment and you're not in the right. Dress code. You're disrespecting everyone in the environment. I hundred percent agree on that. This new narrative that when Sunny J Lab and all that, there's a place for it, but then it's about what you embody. So that was back then, right? So I'm giving you a small example. Yeah. So I mean, in an organization, he's been very strict. But at the same time, a big advantage I've had is that I think he gave me a lot of businesses that were struggling. and mm-hmm. one by one one by one i was able to turn it around so it was a very testing time a couple of years i only had my first office in after 6 7 years of joining the group you know first desk not even office and then i had to prove myself coming up and there's i'm sure you must have read it in other seen other interviews i i don't want to really take more too much time of my first experience of starting my own business with him you know how that happened what i learned from that i was working in you know as a as a waiter in restaurants as working in other investment banks what i learned from that so all that is accumulated and taught got me to be the human being today i am but even today we are continuously our 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 limit is continuously been pushed by him you know he never ever say that you've done a great job he's like no you could do better professionally so you know we take it very positively hmm. and we are always continuously moving by his guidance and So one thing I notice about you is you're very spiritual. You talk about spirituality. You're into meditation and you sort of all sort of things. Are do you think there's a difference between um, uh, spirituality and rationality at times? So let me, since we're talking business slide, right, right? Let me give you a context of spirituality in business, mm-hmm. and I think that'll be able to answer your question as as well. So if you look at a if you look at a cloth of paper, a cloth of uh, a cloth mm-hmm, for mm-hmm. for making dress you know the cloth that is your business the needle and the the sui dhaga you use okay which when you cut your cloth into the shirt size size of your shirt to jodna le to sui dhaga sign sani that is spirituality your cloth is your business spirituality is that only when it is connected then mm-hmm. you can wear the shirt properly 
And that's the interlinkage between spirituality and business. Do you ever find uh, this battle where you're like, there's never a side word, like you need to do more and more and more on your side word saying, you need to settle down, okay, now satisfy it, happiness, I don't know, I, I, like I told you, you know, I'm, I'm, my, my purpose is that I, I, whatever we are doing to the community, not only in Nepal, worldwide, in terms of our CSR foundation work, we, we, we've got to do a lot, lot more. And if I have to do a lot, lot more, I have to start building my organization a lot, lot bigger. Uh, and I, I think it's with that purpose that I'm like, I need to, for me, every day I need to grow my business. I need to grow my corporate. I need to grow my house, business house. You know, only when I'm able to generate more wealth and do I have that liberty to give more to the society. So I'm driven by that quite a lot. So I'm running a rat race. I'm not. Mm, mm. I'm running my own race for my own purpose, for my own vision, for my own goal. And, uh, you know, I, if, if, if I need to go and do that, if it takes me 24 hours, I'll, I'll do that. You know, I'll achieve it because that's a, that's a priority for me. But I'll also make sure that I have a good work-life balance also in terms of it. You know, I will not let go of the time I have with for myself, for my family, for the things I'm doing. I'll balance it out and do it. But my my, my focus, my that to bullseye once, the origin banle answer that is not going to change. Okay? So there's never been a feeling that I'm I'm overrunning or burning myself down. No, because I'm driv- I'm just driven by a different energy coming from me. Okay? I'm going on. A, I'm it's a different purpose I'm aiming at. I'm not chasing money per se. I'm chasing a particular impact or a particular objective or a particular goal that will have and create a huge uh, impact on you know making a better society i'm truly truly driven by that now i look current economic turmoil by that so whatever is happening i talk to everyone like anyone who has a business be it small large uh, the business is in the market is down by 30 40 50 percent once after from definition now and um how do you see this like prediction like you normal back to normal or what's the solution why is it happening because technical people or some academics or some there's one perspective that comes out but you being directly involved in so many businesses and so many industries you can so oversee so many things from a third or a bird's eye perspective Buddha. what is the state of economy right now it's definitely challenging and it's not happened overnight. Mm-hmm. There's been a number of reasons why it's happened, you know. Um, let me give you an example of our food company. Now, in the food company, because of a sheer war in Ukraine, which has had tremendous impact in the price of oil, cooking oil, ha- of sunflower oil or palm oil, has resulted in the raw material prices to come up. Because of the increase in price of oil and gas, this co- repercussions are there in forex. There are repercussions then in plastic, all of that. So tell you that your all your overall co- then because of the COVID because of yeah. I think do you think that's the starting point of all these things? No, I think in the entire you know in the entire if you see a particular wave, that's one part which really did it. But let's say 2018 or or even 2000. Two or two thousand one, you know, when the global recession hit, mm-hmm. it hit Europe. Then there was the ASEAN co, the you know the the country, the ASEAN countries had a major turmoil that is going on, and the economy just collapsed. Um, the there are small and various factors that slowly accumulated to bringing this and exploding it. COVID definitely was a big one, you know, it, it affected the tourism sector in a big way it affected the aviation sector in a big way but then what came out of it local tourism started coming out of it right there was a new economy mm-hmm. opened up um, today again coming back to that example of the repercussions of something happening in ukraine and the impact it has in our country raw material prices went off the roof you're pretty much selling everything at if not loss break even right at a particular sales sales revenue projection that you've had now at the same time your country's forex and your liquidity crisis has come all your uh, you know consumers 
how spending power or or consumption has gone up by half so what has happened your consumption has gone up your raw material packing material your your costs have gone double right you in a situation of of a pretty big trouble so only when you have situation like this is when you start remembering that a we needed to do a risk mitigation or a risk you know management whenever we did this industry then people start realizing this only when people start having an earthquake do they exactly. say i wish i had done an insurance of this thing so you know today we've realized that we need to earmark enough capital for times like this we need to put set aside enough funds for times like this right but we need to be able to take some harsh decisions to make sure that the operation is sustaining we don't need exorbitant profit but we need to sustain it interest rates have gone up right who can borrow money today's day and age at 15% and do a project right it's very difficult uh, who can why would anyone spend more when today just by putting money in a bank you are earning 15% deposit so the entire cash flow at the market level is getting squeezed okay? so real consumption is not happening however your remittance overall is going going up your bop is gone up so sooner or later people are coming back to buying more stuff buying the household goods buying fmcg buying electronics so that's that cycle is happening it's a cycle okay we were looking at i was hearing about bitcoin going up to 64000 it's come down to 18000 where right. is it going now right it's gone up to 30000 i think mm -hmm. not that i trade or have any idea i'm just someone it's a cycle right someone who's very intrigued by understanding this mm. but it's a cycle now it's in that cycle how you take things to your advantage is what differentiates a good and a great entrepreneur okay? mm -hmm. there was a bank that was uh, that we guys recently acquired in a very very chaotic environment chaotic economy where the uh, shareholders of the bank just did not have confidence in the country they thought in the it'll take them another 5 years to sort of turn around and grow the bank to where it was that was their call our call was completely different we saw that you know economy is is going to start bouncing back things are going to start changing and that's exactly what happened so it was a entrepreneurial call no amount of research materials or or feedback from investment banks or world bank reports can give you that that's when an entrepreneurial gut feel comes hmm. you know today you're let's say in a building material company you might have an edge against someone else who's not able to do it is not able to run his business but if you want to build your capacity instead of spending a thousand dollars in a new plant you probably get that plant for 200 dollars that's an opportunity hmm. like they say be greedy when others are fearful and be fearful when others are greedy kind of like that in a way mm -hmm. in a way but not ruthlessly okay? yeah not ruthlessly you can't put someone in a gunpoint saying mm. you're screwed right i want this no it has to be done in a win win situation where it's also helping that person to probably clear off their loans etc and similarly for us i mean you know we've never been in a situation in our group's history you know we guys put up the largest cement company now it's running we guys started our own hydropower projects we got investments going on in it and fttth etc our current businesses portfolio and segments are increasing so there's a vicious cycle of cash flow management all of that interest rates are going up now my plan for example 1000 rupees right just my interest on that thing every month is 20 but my market ko conditions le garda consumption talo gaya ra cost garda i could have paid those 20 from my existing cash flow but my cash flow is 10 inflow is 10 and outflow needs to be 20 what do i do things like bringing in a strategic partner so that i reduce my cash flow you know maybe increasing the prices of something taking a call increasing my margins so this is cash flow is the cash flow is the name of the game today cash is king today hmm. but i'm only focusing on sectors that's going on my core businesses that's going to help me grow do you think you sabhi ko pasadi there's real estate issues or opening 
a little bit i think i think some of the decisions the state or the stakeholders in the state could have been a little bit more better i think it was a fear of what's happening in sri lanka that mm-hmm. uh, they're not they didn't they didn't really make such decisions but i'm also seeing in the last few days that that scenario is changing gradually so i'm again pretty optimistic that things are going to come back so do you think like the trend is reversing oily i think it's come coming out of the bottom pit okay definitely So last one discussion before we leave. Okay. This is for the entrepreneurs. Like could any company or a grow or the there is a stage where you need um uh, you need extra capital or raise funds or stuff like that, right? Now, it's not just about raising fund, but being in a state where your company is investment ready because that sets out a marker jahan se your company is now it's stable one. What do you think are the markers that defines a company where it is once an investment ready and attractive for investors? See firstly I am it's my personal opinion right firstly I think you hear about the successes of Facebook Google let's say the startups that started from the garage and came up you know you don't hear about the failures of the other 1000 companies okay? right so we are in this thing that startup banda sad I'm going to I'm going to you know change the world yes you could but people get too desperate too fast to grow okay number one number two is that uh, you know the key thing for any startup to work apart from having a idea that that matches with the people around you is having the right people around you is knowing that my strength is sales and marketing i need the best guy for finance and accounts i need the best guy for manufacturing like my to share the same goal that's the kind of thing that is missing a lot you know the entrepreneur feels i can do everything right so then what happens is when you're going to the investors the investors have a lock in i'm only going to invest if you are doing only you are stuck for 5 years then it closes your doors for doing anything else but if you come in as a team with each and everyone's strengths then you are basically developing an institution okay you're build, developing a system then no matter who comes there tomorrow the company is going to go into its own trajectory right so my take has always been that instead of having a owning a big piece of a small cake get this mindset out and don't worry yeah. about owning a smaller piece of a very big cake you know get in the right people who whose values are there if you feel that today i do not have the right equity and all of that get in like minded people to become partners or put in equity with you you know just because you started a business one year and you see it going to a bank and taking loan is the easiest bit right get talking to a private equity or venture capital fund is the second bit to it but in your startup phase the series a second year of operations i mean the peas and the venture capitalists are sharks they will eat you up they will in good times you know give you the cash but in bad times they will make your life a living hell bad time so what i'm trying to tell you what i'm trying to what i want to tell the youth is don't be too desperate to start saying i want to be the next facebook or the next google first step try and get experience in other companies at their cost see how a company functions see how finance is run see how different aspects of a company is run once you've learned from other people's investments and mistakes then first step is to bring together a right minded founders knowing what each and every one's strengths are that's what jack ma did in alibaba that's what steve jobs did in apple that's what microsoft did uh, bill gates did in microsoft you name a company there's always been people who've come in together or you should have the ability to bring in the right person and have that cash flow to be able to afford that right think big start small be frugal the problem i see is someone comes in with a startup as a brilliant idea next thing i know he's driving a fancy car or has mm. a fancy office mm. don't be drawn in by that you'll start making wrong decisions stick to the ethos of your plan grow there enough companies will queue up to be a part of your company because everyone's looking at the market okay? today e seva for example 
I mean, you got ten people wanting to take a stake on it. Did they go to somewhere? Perhaps one or two people for initial seed capital. Do they need to go? Do they need to raise funds? Yes. Are they going anywhere? No. People are coming to them because people have understood. They have a credible track record. They built a team over a period of time, and they know where to take the company. Have patience. You know. Nepal go you same same formula. Same thing, man. No, no. Nepal go entrepreneur ecosystem. Do you think like people are too um, in a hurry to raise capital? You know, I feel that uh, one big mistake majority of the people are making is that we are looking at Nepal as our market. Okay. So, तबेले जत्ती जी गरे पनी Nepal is your market. Correct. So, even if I open up a e-commerce innovative company. How much can I really grow to in this in Nepal market in a competitive landscape? But if my strategic angle is Amazon's not in Nepal, mm-hmm. okay, five years I'll build this company and build in a fabulous set of uh, customer base. I'll do fabulous number of revenue, but my cash flow and my profitability will be very it'll be nothing. I'll just sustain the company strategically. I want to go to Amazon because for Amazon Nepal is too small, but sooner or later Amazon will come here. So Amazon is just, Amazon is just going to come to my company and say, "Boss, how much is your company worth?" And that's the time I play the valuation game mm. because for Amazon it's easier to acquire a company than to right. come and set up shop. So that's an advantage and a strategic input. I don't think we are we are building into our into our goals and our vision. Game. You know, like I, I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs. Fabulous ideas, great ideas. Okay, great ideas. But what then? So you know, there was this gentleman who had come up with this app called Gully App. Mm-hmm. Have you heard of him? Mm, no, no. So young guy, you know, he was part of our Nabil School of Social Entrepreneurship, and we were incubating and training people. And he's like, "Dai, I've got these." 3D cameras, and I'm going gully gully ma, and I'm trying to integrate it and create my own maps because Bolly, mm-hmm. anyone wants to deliver foods, they need to now log on to my map, and they know exactly kunsa gharo kunsa because our streets, our city streets are not named properly, houses are not numbered properly, and I thought that was a brilliant idea, and he's like, I asked him, but how how do you think you're going to monetize it? He said very simple thing. I'm going to give it to the delivery company, logistics company. I'm going to give it to postal company. And tomorrow, if Google wants to, you know, come in depth into Nepal, I'm the only one they can buy. Now that is someone who's going to be building a big company, which is a very relative term. In fact, by the way, there are a lot of local companies who are doing well, all of that. But from my perspective, that you know, today's day and age, you know, we're all living in a boundaryless world. Okay. The world is your market. It's that it's that state of mind and that that your own inherent perception and the way you're looking at things. You know, there's this guy who was wanted to sell shoes, okay, in this small village, <laughs> and he sent two of his sales guys, and one of them came back. Saying that, sir, no one wears shoes here. We're wasting mm. our time. And the other one was so excited, coming back, boss. No one wears shoes here. Just imagine what all we can sell. So I guess attitude is key. State of mind is key. Like you know, I've been in Nepal for the last twenty-four years now, twenty-three years. I could be living anywhere. The potential I see in our country, the beauty I see in our country, the people I meet, just falling more and more in love with this country every day. And I'm proud of being a Nepali. Thank you so much, Dai. Any last words that you'd like to add in? No, I think we've covered a lot. Um, you know, I I just it's very 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 important for people to define you know the purpose in their life, and then everything else will come clear. Okay, you know, a lot of people are going out from Nepal, which I don't blame them, but a lot of people are here. I uh, just want to tell them: don't lose heart. Just just believe in your country. Do whatever you're doing. One every drop of us, everything that we are doing in our own respective way is going to make take this country forward. Asai, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much.